Uh, yeah, so we just had a great introduction to a lot of the concepts that I'm going to talk about. So uh, thank you, Kim, <laughs> uh, as well as to Linda. So um, I'm also interested in, in uh, the process of mitosis and in, uh, in particular chromosome segregation. And I'm a postdoc in Sue Biggins' lab at the Hutch. And so today, yeah, I guess I wanted to start by thanking um, really the Allen Institute for the invitation to speak. And um, yeah, really, it's, it's been a great symposium so far. And yeah, I'm very excited to tell you about some of our work looking at how tension stabilizes kinetochore microtubule interactions. OK, so a lot of this uh, we've just heard, but I'll go through it very briefly. So I'm interested in the process of chromosome segregation. Um, the end goal of this process is to generate two genetically identical cells that each get exactly one copy of every duplicated chromosome. So the way that this works is that chromosomes, as we've heard, attach to spindle microtubules. And they are physically pushed and pulled around the cell, such that in metaphase, they uh, align in the middle of the cell. And then in anaphase, these uh, duplicated sister chromatids get pulled apart from each other to opposite poles. OK, so while this is an extremely fundamental question in cell biology, uh, there are, it's also incredibly important in, in particular diseases, such as cancer. So to highlight this point, I'm going to show you a couple of videos. Um, on the left, I'm going to show you a video of a, a normal cell undergoing mitosis. So here, the chromosomes are going to be marked in white, and the microtubules are going to be marked in green. And so what I want to point out is all the chromosomes are going to get pushed in the middle of the cell. And ultimately, in anaphase, each of the resulting cells is going to get one copy of every chromosome. So all of the chromosomes um, get aligned properly, and they get segregated equally across this mitotic spindle. OK, so if we look at the same situation, but now in a cancer cell, the story is very different. So here, what we see is that the chromosomes still attach to the mitotic spindle, but a number of the chromosomes do not attach properly and do not align in the middle of the cell, as can be seen up here. And what happens is this top cell ends up getting too many chromosomes, and this bottom cell ends up getting too few chromosomes. And as we've heard, this is a state known as aneuploidy. And uh, this is aneuploidy is a hallmark of nearly all solid tumors, and it has been proposed to play a role in potentially tumor initiation and or progression. So we think that it's incredibly important for us to understand how this process works. OK. So we heard a lot about this in the previous two talks, but the, the protein complex that we study is on the other side of the microtubule, which is the, kinet is the kinetochore. And so uh, this is the way that the chromosomes actually physically attach to the microtubule. OK, so this is a large protein complex that assembles on centromeric DNA. OK, and as I said, it, it constitutes the microtubule attachment site. And it's a, a very large and complicated protein complex. Uh, there are greater than 90 unique components. Many of these uh, components are actually conserved in, in, from yeast all the way up to humans. OK, so what, we've, what we also heard and have seen some movies about is that these, these attachments are not just static attachments. And in fact, um, they're, they're quite dynamic. And so I'm just going to show you another movie now showing the kinetochores and what a cell looks like when it's in metaphase. And what I want you to take away from this so I guess first to orient you, so we're looking at kinetochores in green, and microtubules are shown in red. And what you can see is that these kinetochores are attaching to microtubules as they're growing and shrinking. OK. And so um, this brings up, I guess, an interesting point, and that's to remind you guys is that microtubules are these dynamic protein polymers, which again, we've heard about. But just to show you diagram, a diagram of this, so they can exist in states of assembly and can switch to undergo disassembly and, and can switch back. And so the job of the kinetochore is actually made more difficult by the fact that it has these dramatically different tip structures uh, that have been observed on assembling and disassembling microtubule tips. And the kinetochore needs to have a way to attach to both of these tip structures. OK. So uh, the other thing the kinetochore needs to do to mediate proper chromosome segregation is make what's known as a bi-oriented attachment. So here I'm diagramming a bi-oriented attachment. So now the sister kinetochores are shown in red. Microtubules are shown in green. And so the, the important point here is that these sister kinetochores attach to microtubules that emanate from opposite poles. And so this is going to lead to proper chromosome segregation in anaphase. OK, so while this is an, a correct attachment, a number of incorrect attachment configurations can also occur, such as these ones I'm showing you below. And all of these attachment configurations are going to lead to chromosome missegregation. And so the cell needs to have a way to detect these attachment errors and ultimately correct them before it, uh, undergoing anaphase. OK. And so many years of work and many labs have uh, come up with the, the following idea about how this is sensed in the cell. And so what's, what the current idea is that a correctly bi-oriented attachment such as this one generates tension across a pair of sister kinetochores. 
And it's this tension that leads to stabilized microtubule attachments. So conversely, an attachment that is incorrect and lacks tension, such as this one, is selectively destabilized by the cell. So this is a key and open question still in the field. It's, it's I think, pretty clear that tension is leading to stabilized attachments, but how does this work, I think, is still a very open question, and that's the question that we wanted to address. How does tension stabilize attachments? Okay, so our approach has been to reconstitute kinetochore microtubule attachments in vitro. To this end, the Biggins Lab had previously developed protocols to purify intact kinetochore particles from budding yeast. So here I'm showing you a negative stain EM image of one of these purified kinetochores bound to the tip of a taxol stabilized microtubule. We can then also, working in Chip Asbury's lab, use an optical trap based assay to monitor uh, kinetochore microtubule attachments under tension. So briefly, the way that this works, it's slightly different than what Kim talked about. Now the kinetochore is attached to, to a bead, which can be manipulated using an optical trap. We then have microtubules, dynamic microtubules that are grown from, this, from a cover slip. And we can attach these kinetochores to the tip of the dynamic microtubule and then place uh, different amounts of force across this kinetochore microtubule interface. Okay, and so when we do an experiment like this, a typical, a typical experiment looks something like this. Where here I'm plotting the position of the microtubule tip over time, and this microtubule tip has a kinetochore bound, and that kinetochore microtubule interface is placed under a constant amount of force, in this case 1.7 piconewtons. Okay, so we can measure rates of microtubule assembly as well as disassembly, the frequency of uh, switches between these two states, catastrophes and rescues, as well as the frequency with which the kinetochore detaches from the microtubule tip. Okay, and finally, what we, can, we can also look at the overall duration or the lifetime of the attachment. Okay, so if we focus in on this lifetime, and you imagine if we measured the lifetimes of attachments over a range of forces, the curve would look something like this, where at low forces you have long-lived lifetimes, and as you increase force across the kinetochore microtubule interface, you're going to see a decrease in the lifetime of the attachment. So when these measurements were made using purified kinetochores, what was found is that at low forces, there was a moderate lifetime of around 20 minutes. However, quite remarkably, as you increase force, you increase the lifetime of the attachment. Okay. And this, of course, is, is only to a point at, at even higher forces now, the kinetochore microtubule interface is going to rupture, um, and you're going to see, again, a decrease in the lifetime. But this showed us that tension itself can directly stabilize uh, the lifetime of a kinetochore microtubule attachment. So in this way, we think that this is an inherent uh, physical property of kinetochore microtubule interactions. And in this way, we think that the kinetochore is working much, much like a finger trap in that the harder you pull, the harder the kinetochore is actually going to hold on. And for the aficionados in the audience, this appears to be independent of the other tension sensing pathway in the cells, which is mediated by Aurora B. Okay, so we wanted to understand mechanistically how does tension stabilize attachments? How is this, how is this actually working? So insights into that question came from two observations. The first is that the kinetochore, and I think this is kind of was surprising to us, the kinetochore preferentially binds to assembling microtubules relative to disassembling microtubules. So here is a kinetochore, a diagram of a kinetochore bound to an assembling microtubule tip. The microtubule can switch to undergo disassembly and can switch back. However, um, the kinetochore can also detach from either of these two uh, microtubule tip states at a particular rate. So when, when we measure these rates of detachment from either assembling or disassembling tips, what we find is that the detachment rates are, dr are dramatically different. So from an assembling tip, we see that the de detachment rate is significantly lower than from a the, de than the detachment rate from a disassembling tip. Okay, so this suggests that the attachment to an assembling microtubule is a strong state, and the attachment to a disassembling microtubule is a weak attachment state. Okay, and the other observation that was made is that increasing tension tends to promote microtubule assembly, which again is the strong state. So in this way, we think that tension can, it can increase the length of, of microtubule attachment. Okay, so I was interested in determining whether there were kinetochore associated factors that could affect either of these two behaviors. So uh, factors that I were, was interested in were potentially factors that could affect um, this, uh, the, could promote microtubule assembly as, as tension is increased, or perhaps factors that uh, exhibit or that give this um, preference for the, of the kinetochore to bind to the assembling relative to the disassembling tip. Okay, so all the work I'm going to show you for the rest of the talk is related to this protein STU2. 
So STU2 is a uh, conserved microtubule polymerase. Um, there are family members from budding yeast all the way up to, uh, to human cells. Uh, it's, it binds to curved tubulin uh, subunits at the, at the tip of the microtubule, and it's a TOG domain containing protein, which binds to the free tubulin and incorporates uh, t tubulin dimers into the growing end of the microtubule. Okay, so while this, this is its known role, we, we think the rest of the story that I'm going to tell you is that we think that there is also a kinetochore factor. Okay, so s what we first found is that STU2 associates with our isolated kinetochores. So here I'm showing you western blots of our purified kinetochores looking for the presence of STU2, as well as two canonical uh, kinetochore proteins, CTF19 and DSN1. What you can see is that STU2 is present. What I don't have time to show you is that this association with the kinetochore appears to be microtubule independent. And in fact, we've gone on to map the, the kinetochore binding site of STU2, and that appears to be the outer kinetochore NDC80 complex. And this is consistent with some very nice work uh, from, from fission yeast, as well as uh, some of our work with the, uh, using recombinant human proteins. So we think that this is a, uh, a kinetochore resident pool. It's a conserved interaction between the STU2 family member and the outer kinetochore NDC80 complex, and we think that this is a, a kinetochore resident pool that's not associated with the microtubule tip. Okay, so now we wanted to ask what is the kinetochore function of, of this pool of STU2? Okay, for this question, we turned, uh, so we wanted to, to remove it from kinetochores. So to do this, we turned to an oxygen-inducible degradation system, or aid system. So here, we, uh, upon addition of oxygen to the media, we get rapid degradation of the protein. If we purify kinetochores from these same conditions, what we find is that we can purify kinetochores that lack STU2, but that uh, the remaining composition of the kinetochore ap appears to be completely normal. Okay, so now we can ask what is the function of kinetochores, or what is the behavior of kinetochores that lack STU2? Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm, I'm just going to jump straight, straight to the punchline of, of what we found, and that is that this tension-dependent stabilization of kinetochore microtubule interactions depends completely on the presence of, of STU2. Okay, so I've shown you before that wild-type kinetochores display this tension-dependent stabilization where upon increasing force, you increase the lifetime of the attachment. So for reference, if we look at a mutant in the essential outer kinetochore DAM1 complex uh, from a strain DAD1-1, we see that these kinetochores have short-lived lifetimes at all forces examined. So when we look at kinetochores that lack only STU2, shown, uh, shown here as STU2 aid, what you can see is that this tension-dependent stabilization is completely abolished. And interestingly, there appear to be two things going on. So at high forces, what is, I think, quite interesting is that uh, we see that the it appears that STU2 tends to promote attachments because in its absence, we have very short-lived attachments. And in this way, this is very similar to the DAM1 mutant I showed you before. I think what's even more interesting is that something else is going on at low forces. Here, it appears that the presence of STU2 is actually inhibiting attachments because in its absence, we're actually getting longer-lived lifetimes than you see on the wild-type kinetochore that has STU2 present. Okay, so for the final few minutes I have, um, I'm gonna talk about what we think is going on mechanistically here. And so the obvious candidate mechanism that we wanted to look at was that uh, microtubule dynamics were going to be altered in the presence or absence of this microtubule polymerase. However, quite surprisingly, we find that microtubule dynamics were not altered. Um, so what we did find, however, is coming back to this idea that I showed you before, that there's this differential attachment stability to assembling relative to disassembling microtubule tips. So first, focusing on the attachment stability to an assembling microtubule, Again, measuring the detachment rate from assembling microtubule tips. What we find is that wild-type kinetochores, um, again, detach very infrequently from an assembling microtubule. Again, remember, this is the strong attachment state that I showed you before. When you remove STU2 from the kinetochore, now the detachment frequency goes, goes way up. And so these are much weaker attachments. And so this suggests that the presence of STU2 is actually promoting attachments to assembling microtubules. The story is very different on a disassembling microtubule. So here, what, um, what we have found is that, as I showed you before, wild-type kinetochores that have STU2 present detach very frequently from disassembling microtubules. What is uh, interesting is that that high detachment rate actually depends on the presence of STU2. So here, when we get rid of STU2, now the kinetochore holds on much, much better. So in this way, it suggests that STU2 is actually impeding attachments to disassembling microtubules. 
And what I don't have time to show you, but what is equally interesting is that this destabilizing activity of STU2 actually is turned off as you increase tension across the kinetochore microtubule interface. Okay, so to end, I'm just gonna summarize on the final two slides here. What we've found is that STU2 confers tension sensitivity to kinetochore microtubule interactions. At low force, it appears that STU2 inhibits attachments, predominantly by inhibiting attachments to uh, disassembling microtubule tips. And at high force, STU2 has the opposite effect, and that opposite effect, and it actually uh, promotes attachments. And so it's these dichotomous uh, effects of STU2 that result in this tension-dependent stabilization of kinetochore microtubule interactions. And I think quite interestingly, these effects do not appear to be related to altered microtubule dynamics. Okay, so to just end with a, a model of how we think this fits in with, with sort of uh, the chromosome. So we start here with an incorrect attachment uh, that has low tension across the kinetochore microtubule interface. The role of, of kinetochore associated STU2 is to, se is to selectively destabilize these attachments. Uh, so, so STU2 will release these attachments that lack tension, and this gives the cell another chance to make an, a, a correct attachment. So when another attachment is made, you can either make another incorrect attachment and the cycle continues, or you can make a correct attachment. If you make a correct attachment, a bioriented attachment, this generates higher amounts of tension across the kinetochore microtubule interface. And what's really interesting is that this destabilizing activity of STU2 is turned off. And now a second function of STU2 comes on, gets turned on, and it actually tends to promote these uh, tension-bearing attachments. Okay, so with that, I'll just stop and say thanks uh, to Sue and the whole Biggins lab. Um, as well as Chip Asbury, where a lot of this uh, work was done, and uh, various collaborators um, for, and their respective colleagues for help along the way and funding. And with that, I'll, be, I'll thank you guys for your attention and take questions. Got a question, a couple in the back and one in the front over here. I was just wondering, that was really nice, but I was just wondering, um, is there anything uh, in the structure of STU2 that suggests it's mechanosensitive, has mul adopts multiple conformations, anything like that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so uh, the short answer is no, but um, it is known to have, uh, so, it's, so the, it's a really good question. So we're, we're trying to now work to figure out if it's something about the, the, the structure of C2 that changes with tension, or whether it's perhaps changing the, the structure of the microtubule tip. Because you can imagine as you increase tension, you could actually change the structure of the tip such that, for instance, these protofilaments are going to be peeling back more or less. And STU2 is known to be sensitive to the, the curvature of the, of the tubulin uh, dimers that it's binding to. So, so one idea is that it's actually not, that tension is not changing STU2 itself, but is actually changing the microtubule tip structure. However, there, there, uh, it is an idea that we're pursuing to see if there's something that changes with STU2 itself. So it's a great question. It, it seems like an obvious way to prevent um, detachment would be just to polymerize more, to lengthen the microtubule. And you said this was a, a microtubule kind of extending enzyme. Yep. I think you also said that when it was present, you did get more extension, right? You do get lengthening when it's present. So um, so how do you exclude that it's kind of a trivial thing then, that it's just uh, allowing the microtubule to get longer as, as you're pulling on it? Yeah, so sorry. Uh, so yes, that's a, that's a good point. And actually, that's we started working on this protein because we thought it was going to affect microtubule dynamics. Um, so, and I, I actually, we don't see any effect on, on microtubule dynamics, either the amount of, so the lengthening of microtubules or shortening or, or any parameter we've looked at in the presence or absence of, of STU2. And so we, we don't actually think that it's a trivial answer that it's just affecting the dynamics and, for instance, uh, making more microtubules that are, that are assembling and, and thus can hold on better. Um, that was actually the, the idea going into it, but it turns out it was something completely different. There's no change in dynamics. Is that microtubules under load or, or just free microtubules? In these are, yeah, these are all under, so yes. So what I'll say in, in our assay, we see no under load. We see no differences in microtubule dynamics. Um, 
Definitely, it, just free microtubules. Um, certainly, if you use the, so this is the, you know, all of the experiments were done with cow tubulin um, for obvious reasons. And, um, and so what we can, so in those conditions, people have found that STU2 actually does not function very well as a, as a microtubule polymerase. Um, if you use, for instance, the, the uh, frog version of this, then you see that it does function as a microtubule polymerase. Um, when you use yeast tubulin with the yeast STU2, then, then it has been observed that you do see differences in microtubule polymerization and depolymerization rates. Um, but I think we actually maybe got lucky in that we used a system where we could separate these two functions, where we can not affect microtubule dynamics, but we actually do affect uh, attachment stability. And so I think maybe, yeah, so, but we do want to do the experiments with, um, with congenic yeast tubulin as well. We're working, it's a, for reasons that are technical, I guess it's not obvious, but for technical reasons, we're unable to do that at this point, but we're working towards that. I'm sorry, so you're saying if you pull the microtubule, it grows, right? Yes. And so does it still grow in the absence of CT? Yes, it absolutely. So the rates are, and I, I should have maybe shown that, but there's no differences. They, they still grow and shrink at the exact same rate in the presence or absence of STU2. Any other questions? Great, thank you.